All right, good afternoon, boys and girls. This is video six of our flipped classroom, and we're going to be reading tonight the interlopers. This is only a one, two, three, four, five page story in your book, so I hope you can deal with this. Um, basically, I'm just going to give you a quick little five minute preview of the story. And I want you to read the text if you choose, as we did with the Most Dangerous Game, to skip over that and um, just uh, listen to the end of my uh, end of my lesson as well. That's fine. Uh, but I will put again the audio version of the text in here if you want to read along. And I also found, as as usual, with uh, this great classic literature, uh, free online, The Interlopers by Saki. Uh, Saki is not his real name. His name is Monroe. Um, basically, he uses this as a pen name. They actually have this at the end of our text, uh, I believe, but uh, it is just a pen name. And he is a one of the great uh, short story writers of all times. And you will um, you'll be seeing him again in tenth grade as well in the short stories unit there. So anyway, the interlopers we'll be reading today. I uh, just want to point out in your textbook, it's not on my computer screen, but in your textbook on page 94, it gives you some background for the story. That's very important, especially when you take a quiz after reading this test. You're going to want to know the setting of the story. It's basically set um, in countries like Poland, Slovakia, Romania, the Ukraine. The, um, the Carpathian mountain range there uh, is set up, and during this time period, um, he was uh, Saki, I believe, was uh, back in the 1800s. The it, these mountain ranges were owned by families, rich families that would own acres and acres of mountain range. And why this is very important is actually this is about two um, aristocratic families that own land. And um, basically, one of the things that really confuses a lot of the students when they're reading the short story is that they're guarding this most jealously plotted piece of land. Um, Again, I am going to draw right on my screen right now and kind of try to map out, say for example, if one of my guys owns uh, a whole bunch of land like this and some mountains and his land came up like this, okay? This other guy owns land that basically would kind of run maybe here and you know, their, their lands would be hundreds of acres and great farming and fishing and lakes and all sorts of stuff. But these two guys own some land it's just a narrow strip of land. Now, not only that, this land, it says, is precipitous, which we know from our vocabulary means very steep. So it's precipitous land, steep land, which means trees are kind of growing like this down the mountainside. Um, it, it's not good for hunting, not good for farming. And why they fight over this narrow strip of land, I don't know. Uh, well, I do know. It's because men are hard-headed um, beings and generally I think of my grandfather when I think of uh, these two guys um, Znayim and Gradvitz are the last names of these guys they even sound like my, my grandpa grandpa Gilo he was kind of a guy who would be like I don't care that little strip of land back there by the back corner of my yard that's my land and she's got her fence over or her trees growing on my land you got any grandpas like that well that's what these two guys are like um, one guy believed to have owned this strip of land. This other family comes in and um, and wrestles it away from them in a court of law. So one family actually is the owner, and the other guy goes and hunts here. Why? Just because he still feels it's his land. He had it first, that type of stuff. So he goes and hunts his land. Well, the real owner is out this night, and he's guarding his land with a bunch of his hunters. And they're going out there to, to um, basically protect the land it's not very valuable a little irony here right boys and girls um good morals in these short stories right life is too short to worry about crap like this so um it's, it's just a great moral these boys are going out they're all going out to hunt on this bad bad stormy night and somebody's going to intervene or, or something a storm's going to come lightning's going to happen what's lightning what does lightning represent? What does it symbolize? You guys know Greek mythology, right? So anyway, lightning strikes. A tree comes down and crushes these two guys. And it's just so perfectly fitting. Traps them down. And um, I kind of feel like somebody's going to tell these boys, sit down and talk it out. You two guys, talk it out right now. Figure out your problems because you're acting like a bunch of babies. And we get these great themes to the, the morals of these stories. It's like life is too short. Let's move on and live with this. So anyway, 
Um, I'm not going to give away anything else. So anyway, this is the Interlopers. Enjoy the story, and um, I'm going to clear my face and start up the... The Interlopers. The Interlopers. By Saki. In a forest of mixed growth somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians, a man stood one winter night, watching and listening as though he waited for some beast of the woods to come within the range of his vision and later of his rifle. But the game for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful and proper for the chase. Ulrich von Gradwitz patrolled the dark forest in quest of a human enemy. The forest lands of Gradwitz were of wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipitous woodland that lay on its outskirt was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded, but it was the most jealously guarded of all its owner's territorial possessions. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather had wrested it from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced in the judgment of the courts, and a long series of poaching affrays and similar scandals had embittered the relationships between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown into a personal one since Ulrich had come to be head of his family. If there was a man in the world whom he detested and wished ill to, it was Georg Znaim, the inheritor of the quarrel and the tireless game snatcher and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might, perhaps, have died down or been compromised if the personal ill will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys, they had thirsted for one another's blood. As men, each prayed that misfortune might fall on the other. And this wind-scourged winter night, Ulrich had banded together his foresters to watch the dark forest. Not in quest of four-footed quarry but to keep a lookout for the prowling thieves whom he suspected of being afoot from across the land boundary. The roebuck, which usually kept in the sheltered hollows during a storm wind, were running like driven things tonight, and there was movement and unrest among the creatures that were wont to sleep through the dark hours. Assuredly, there was a disturbing element in the forest, and Ulrich could guess the quarter from whence it came. He strayed away by himself from the watchers whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wild tangle of undergrowth, peering through the tree trunks and listening through the whistling and skirling of the wind and the restless beating of the branches for sight or sound of the marauders. If only on this wild night, in this dark lone spot, he might come across Georg's Nyam man to man, with none to witness. That was the wish that was uppermost in his thoughts. And as he stepped round the trunk of a huge beech, he came face to face with the man he sought. The two enemies stood glaring at one another for a long, silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand. Each had hate in his heart and murder uppermost in his mind. The chance had come to give full play to the passions of a lifetime. But a man who has been brought up under the code of a restraining civilization cannot easily nerve himself to shoot down his neighbor in cold blood and without a word spoken, except for an offense against his hearth and honor. And before the moment of hesitation had given way to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce shriek of the storm had been answered by a splitting crash over their heads, and ere they could leap aside, a mass of falling beech tree had thundered down on them. Ulrich von Gradwitz found himself stretched on the ground, one arm numb beneath him, and the other held almost as helplessly in a tight tangle of forked branches while both legs were pinned beneath the fallen mass. His heavy shooting boots had saved his feet from being crushed to pieces, but if his fractures were not as serious as they might have been, at least it was evident that he could not move from his present position till someone came to release him. The descending twigs had slashed the skin of his face, and he had to wink away some drops of blood from his eyelashes before he could take in a general view of the disaster. At his side, so near that under ordinary circumstances he could almost have touched him, lay Georg Snaim alive and struggling, but obviously 
as helplessly pinioned down as himself. All round them lay a thick strewn wreckage of splintered branches and broken twigs. Relief at being alive and exasperation at his captive plight brought a strange medley of pious thank offerings and sharp curses to Ulrich's lips. Georg, who was nearly blinded with the blood which trickled across his eyes, stopped his struggling for a moment to listen and then gave a short, snarling laugh. <laughs> so you're not killed as you ought to be, but you're caught anyway, he cried. Caught fast. <laughs> what a jest. Ulrich von Gradwitz snared in a stolen forest. There's real justice for you. And he laughed again, mockingly and savagely. I'm caught in my own forest land, retorted Ulrich. When my men come to release us, you will wish, perhaps, that you were in a better plight than caught poaching on a neighbor's land. Shame on you! Georg was silent for a moment. Then he answered quietly. Are you sure that your men will find much to release? I have men, too, in the forest tonight, close behind me, and they will be here first and do the releasing. When they drag me out from under these branches, it won't need much clumsiness on their part to roll this massive trunk right over on the top of you. Your men will find you dead under a fallen beech tree. For form's sake, I shall send my condolences to your family. It is a useful hint, said Ulrich fiercely. My men had orders to follow in ten minutes' time, seven of which must have gone by already, and when they get me out, I will remember the hint. Only as you will have met your death poaching on my lands, I don't think I can decently send any message of condolence to your family. Good, snarled Georg. Good. We fight this quarrel out to the death, you and I and our foresters, with no cursed interlopers to come between us. Death and damnation to you, Ulrich van Gradwitz. The same to you, Georg's name, forest thief, game snatcher. Both men spoke with the bitterness of possible defeat before them, for each knew that it might be long before his men would seek him out or find him. It was a bare matter of chance which party would arrive first on the scene. Both had now given up the useless struggle to free themselves from the mass of wood that held them down. Ulrich limited his endeavors to an effort to bring his one partially free arm near enough to his outer coat pocket to draw out his wine flask. Even when he had accomplished that operation, it was long before he could manage the unscrewing of the stopper or get any of the liquid down his throat. But what a heaven-sent draft it seemed. It was an open winter, and little snow had fallen as yet, Hence the captives suffered less from the cold than might have been the case at that season of the year. Nevertheless, the wine was warming and reviving to the wounded man, and he looked across with something like a throb of pity to where his enemy lay, just keeping the groans of pain and weariness from crossing his lips. Could you reach this flask if I threw it over to you? asked Ulrich suddenly. There is good wine in it, and one may as well be as comfortable as one can. Let us drink, even if tonight one of us dies. No, I can scarcely see anything. There is so much blood caked around my eyes, said Georg. And in any case, I don't drink wine with an enemy. Ulrich was silent for a few minutes, and lay listening to the weary screeching of the wind. An idea was slowly forming and growing in his brain an idea that gained strength every time that he looked across at the man who was fighting so grimly against pain and exhaustion. In the pain and languor that Ulrich himself was feeling, the old fierce hatred seemed to be dying down. Neighbor, he said presently, do as you please if your men come first. It was a fair compact. But as for me, I've changed my mind. If my men are the first to come, you shall be the first to be helped, as though you were my guest. We have quarreled like devils all our lives over this stupid strip of forest where the trees can't even stand upright in a breath of wind. Lying here tonight, thinking, 
I've come to think we've been rather fools. There are better things in life than getting the better of a boundary dispute. Neighbor, if you will help me to bury the old quarrel, I, I will ask you to be my friend. Georg's Nyam was silent for so long that Ulrich thought perhaps he had fainted with the pain of his injuries. Then he spoke slowly and in jerks. How the whole region would stare and gabble if we rode into the market square together. No one living can remember seeing a Znayim and a von Gradwitz talking to one another in friendship. And what peace there would be among the forester folk if we ended our feud tonight. And if we choose to make peace among our people, there is none other to interfere. No interlopers from outside. You would come and keep the Sylvester night beneath my roof. And I would come and feast on some high day at your castle. I would never fire a shot on your land, save when you invited me as a guest. And you should come and shoot with me down in the marshes where the wildfowl are. In all the countryside, there are none that could hinder if we will to make peace. I never thought to have wanted to do other than hate you all my life. But I think I have changed my mind about things too this last half hour. And you offered me your wine flask. Ulrich von Gradwitz, I will be your friend. For a space, both men were silent, turning over in their minds the wonderful changes that this dramatic reconciliation would bring about. In the cold, gloomy forest, with the wind tearing in fitful gusts through the naked branches and whistling round the tree trunks, they lay and waited for the help that would now bring release and succor to both parties. And each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become a friend. Presently, as the wind dropped for a moment, Ulrich broke the silence. Let's shout for help, he said. In this lull, our voices may carry a little way. They won't carry far through the trees and undergrowth, said Georg. But we can try. Together, then. The two raised their voices in a prolonged hunting call. Together again, said Ulrich a few minutes later, after listening in vain for an answering hallo. I heard something that time, I think, said Ulrich. I heard nothing but the pestilential wind, said Georg hoarsely. There was silence again for some minutes, and then Ulrich gave a joyful cry. I can see figures coming through the wood. They are following in the way I came down the hillside. Both men raised their voices in as loud a shout as they could muster. They hear us! They've stopped! Now they see us! They're running down the hill toward us! cried Ulrich. How many of them are there? asked Georg. I can't see distinctly, said Ulrich. Nine or ten? Then they are yours, said Georg. I had only seven out with me. They are making all the speed they can, brave lads said Ulrich gladly. Are they your men? asked Georg. Are they your men? he repeated impatiently, as Ulrich did not answer. <laughs> no, said Ulrich with a laugh, the idiotic chattering laugh of a man unstrung with hideous fear. Who are they? asked Georg quickly, straining his eyes to see what the other would gladly not have seen. Wolves. All right, boys and girls. Um, so that brings uh, our story to a quick close. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple things. Uh, we will review this a little bit in class and uh, compare it to a poem called "The Mending Wall." And um, basically, uh, Robert Frost is a great American poet, and he talks about this wall that base that he has. Um, between his land and a friend of his and how they go out and mend this wall all the time whenever the rocks start to fall over and they they put it back up and it's really it's funny how we are about borders how we are about our land about our 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 yard and making sure the neighbors 
you know, aren't there, and we're, we're so territorial um, that it really seems petty uh, when you think about life in, in, in general. And, um, you know, I just, I really appreciate the story. First thing I want to, I want to make sure you understand, though, is looking at the title of the story. All right, we are uh, going to go back up to the, to the beginning, the interlopers here. Um, an interloper is just somebody that interrupts or intrudes on a um, on something that's going on. So, so somebody that's interrupting or intruding. We have interlopers. Obviously, the title is just it's it's like sevenfold here. Okay, we have one guy who thinks the other guy's interloping on his land. We have another guy who's you know obviously the real owner, and the other guy is interloping on his land. But then we have um, we have as they were starting to reconcile, how they said. Um, you know, nobody could be come between us and our friendship if we chose to do it. Nobody could interlope on that. Um, earlier when they're angry with each other and they're like, well, uh, you know, I'm glad you're pinned down. When my guys get here, they're going to kill you. They, n nobody will be able to interlope on that. Uh, but then let's think about the two other very important ones. And as I said before, um, was it divine intervention? Was it, um, was there a greater force that brought this tree down on these men? Um, and that's a question that the author leaves open and should leave open for the reader. The author's not suggesting there is a force, but if you believe in it, I think it's very easy to read into or and interpret that there was some divine being saying these two guys and generations, their families have been fighting with each other. Sit down and, and end it now. End this feud. Um, so anyway, uh, did, did God intervene? Did, did some supernatural force uh, interlope? on this and finally at the end uh the beautiful thing again suspense be so beautifully done by both authors that we see now richard connell with the most dangerous game and the interlopers the suspense that we have drawing it out till the very last moment and having some sort of a twist in the ending something you didn't expect you know seeing rainsford in his room at the end we saw this great twist at the end you know they think the men are coming to rescue them they've and and and, and how much we want their men to come rescue them now that they've learned right and I don't know, does God have a sense of humor? Is there a wicked sense of humor here saying, oh, I'm glad you guys settled it out, but um, you still have been pretty bad, so uh, here come some wolves. The wolves are, are what uh, interlopes, uh, ends up being the greatest interloper of all. So we have um, just really kind of neat title here, The Interlopers, and we can take a look um, and see how that just is so um, integral to the entire story. But uh, just, just again, what a great short story. The vocabulary in here is very important, boys and girls, because you need to start seeing how to use the, those words appropriately. Uh, the disposed party never acquiesced in the judgment of the course, never accepted that, you know. Uh, as we had in our vocabulary homework, uh, the students never acquiesced to the homework policy and uh, are still not turning in their work. You know, acquiesced. Think about these great words, precipitous land. Um, that we have and, and you know we just we continue to use you know minor fifth grade sixth grade words in our in our everyday uh, speaking okay so as well as sucker which is uh, help given to someone distress and relief so a vocabulary test will be coming up next week as well so pay pa a particular attention to those things but just remember the more you read the more you're going to build your vocabulary and be able to read more and understand more and be um, be able to enjoy life and, and everything to a greater fuller extent okay there is a real purpose to reading and there is a real purpose to english literature so um i hope you enjoyed the story um we will cover a few more tasks in our wrap-up of this story but as i said i really only wanted to keep my my lesson to about a good 10 minutes here so we had about 10 minutes of lesson 15 minutes of audio text and and um i hope you enjoyed the story please come prepared ready to talk about the story uh in class on monday okay We'll see you guys then, and I wish you a very nice weekend.